Hi, everyone, and welcome to the BC Adventure Smart Summer Series. We're kicking off summer with you. Uh, we started this on Tuesday, and tonight's our second special event. And it's all about outdoor recreation safety, you, how you can be prepared. Uh, and tonight's focus is on the interior in the Kootenai region of British Columbia. We've divvied these special events up uh, to four different regions, and we're really excited. It's, it's, we, we do webinars a lot, and we've done lots of online education and training. But this is kind of the first time we've had a host table where we've brought in special guests to join us. So it's not us sharing our message tonight, and some of you may have already heard that, and, and maybe they'll reiterate some things, but they're here to give us their perspective, uh, their insights, and from their experience. We're really fortunate. We've got three amazing guests, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just do a, a little intro about myself, uh, run you through some basic housekeeping, and then we'll uh, we'll kick off. So hopefully you're comfortable and you're set. And thanks again for joining us. We appreciate your time. I'm the executive director for the BC Adventure Smart Program. My name is Sandra Riches, and I've been with the program since inception. So we're just a little over 17 years now, which is hard to believe. Uh, before this, I was a park ranger with BC Parks. That was a few years ago, and studied outdoor recreation and management at Capilano University. I have two kids. My son is 23, and my daughter's 20, which is hard to believe. That's gone like that. And I'm grateful to be joining you today from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. I'm also really grateful for the support that we get from the community, but also from the BC Search and Rescue Association. This is their program. It is a provincial program, and we are the outdoor education program for the province of BC. Based on our first five years of outdoor education in BC uh, in our inception years, uh, the, the federal government saw what we were doing and wanted to see the the information shared right across the country in every province and territory. So a nice feather in our cap. In 2009, the program went national. There is representation in every province and every territory. What's unique about BC, though, is we are supported 100% endorsed uh, by the BC Search and Rescue Association. So we are a sustainable working model with um, sustainable funding. Uh, I have a crew, we have staff, we have a headquarters, and, and we also have over 500 volunteer outdoor educators who've joined us, gotten trained, and share our curriculum at their leisure in their communities. We have one of them here tonight, actually. She wears many hats. That's just one of them. Behind the scenes tonight, we have our tech support, our assistant coordinator, Natasha. She's here to answer and help you with any questions. So you can throw those in your dashboard in the question field. And, uh, and just as we go through, you, you're automatically, unfortunately for you, because we'd love to see you, your cameras are off and you're muted and we will go through your questions and, and we'll give you a chance to ask them after each presentation. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, I also wanna say to the presenters, if you don't mind, if you use any industry lingo, if you use any acronyms tonight, can you please let people know what they are? Uh, one example would be a PLB, personal locator beacon, uh, stuff like that. So if you have any acronyms tonight, please uh, be clear about what they are. Maybe we might know what they are, but maybe the public don't. I'd love to introduce our first special guest and a friend. And, and again, she wears many hats and she's a wealth of information. Wendy has been a member of Kimberly Search and Rescue for 18 and a half years. And in that time, she served on the provincial board and represented BC in the development of the national search and rescue standards. She's been involved in hundreds of searches, search and rescues over the years and has served both on ground and in command. When well, she's not volunteering for SAR, She's been uh, found volunteering her time at Fort Steele with the Clydesdales, camping by the lake with her husband, Peter, and hiking with her dogs and riding her horses in the bush. Wendy's involved in many years, pardon me, Wendy became involved many years ago with Adventure Smart. I remember that, Wendy, uh, and is here to talk tonight about the other side of the coin, really. Seeing people um, on their worst day um, has changed her outlook on prevention and education. She sees. Um, uh, she says she has also supported it um, through all this time, but now is adamant that people need to be prepared. Traveling in the backcountry can be one of the most beautiful and rewarding experiences, and all too often, catastrophic when things go wrong. Welcome, Wendy. Thanks for joining us, and we can't wait to see and hear what you have to share with us tonight. It's over to you. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, yeah, Sandra and I have been friends and uh, on the Adventure Smart team for 17 years, I guess. It's been so uh, 
I am really happy to be here tonight. Um, really honored to be able to come and speak on behalf of Search and Rescue and uh, talk to all of you in the audience as well. It's great. Um, this is my first time doing one of these sorts of things, so bear with me. Um, I'm actually a, um, a teletherapist. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself here in a minute. Um, and uh, I've got, yeah, like she said, 18 and a half years in search and rescue. And by day, I actually have a real job and get paid at some point. I'm a speech language pathologist and I do completely online teletherapy. And I actually have schools in the Northwest Territories and on the small Vancouver Islands, so it's pretty cool. Then 24 seven, I am a SAR manager, a team leader, a swift water rescue technician and a rope rescue leader. So um, I go where I need to go. And then when I don't sleep, and I, I'm actually sleep deprived because we've got two puppies right now and they are up at five o'clock in the morning, every morning. But I have had provincial and national involvement. So I have an overview of across Canada and what SAR is in Canada itself. A um, couple little pictures there of myself. Uh, ski touring is one of my favorite things to do in the winter. And riding my big horse, that is Purdy, Fisherview Jackson Purdy, and he is Canada's national horse. He's a Canadian, so pretty cool. So let me talk a little bit about SAR and BC. Um, we have 79 teams, and this is, gives you an idea about where they are. You can see that many of us are in the southern, southern area. In the East Kootenays, we have eight teams. West has eight and 12 in the Okanagan Central area. We work in conjunction with Emergency Management BC, which is the government, of course, and we are kind of like a second responder. So when you dial 911, they ask you, do you want police, fire, or ambulance? There's no SAR there. So you ask for one of those guys first, and then they decide if you need SAR as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that later because there is, there's, there's some little hints and tips there. Um, we are all volunteers, but we are professionally trained. We take courses through the Justice Institute of BC. We have standards. Um, when everybody, when someone asks me about search and rescue, I always say, uh, we have everything but a paycheck. And that is true. And I'll tell you what, when you meet a SAR volunteer, they chose to volunteer for search and rescue because that's the kind of community they wanted to be a part of. So pretty cool group of people. And here's just a little neat statistic. We in BC have more than 50% of all the calls in Canada. And in fact, that's an older stat and I wouldn't doubt it if we are pushing 60% of all the calls in Canada. So all the provinces and territories, we have the majority. And it's because of our terrain. We um, have an amazing, amazing province. Um, one of the things that Adventure Smart talks about is the three T's. And I find myself talking about it too. Uh, we're just in the midst of um, training a new ground search and rescue class. And I actually bring these things up. We talk about training, we talk about trip planning, we talk about the essentials. They get ready pack, um, a ready pack list. So um, it's really important it, that we even train our own people with it. And one of the things we train them in is map and compass. Hey, Wendy, I don't want to yeah. cut you off. I just, is your slide deck showing? Yep. It's is not, it not for... here for us. Oh, yeah, no, it's showing for me. It's showing for you. Okay, give me a moment here. Sandra here, I don't see it either. And I'm not sure if the public have uh, made any comments yet, if they can see anything, but... Um... Um, there, a web there we go. We can see it now, Wendy. We can see it now. Okay. Awesome. Yes. We're good we're to great. go. Sorry to cut you off there. No, I I'm, I'm next. Yeah, next time yeah, earlier. So, okay, I'm going back to show you my horse. Okay. That's probably the most important picture I have. No, just kidding. <laughs> and here's the picture of all the teams from when I was talking. And of course, the map and compass. And here's where we are right now. So, the three T's. And one of the things we talk about, like I said, is um, map and compass because we have all this electronics and they're only as good as the person who uses them and as long as they're charged. Enough said there. So <clears throat> what do you need to get out there? Um, 
our members have a headlamp, usually two, and the extra batteries. We take fire, we do two. Again, we probably have a lighter and matches, some have flints, and if you have a flint, practice using it. They are not easy to use. We have some kind of a signaling device, and sometimes that's like a little mirror that you can signal with. Um, food and water, clothing, here's our navigation. First aid kits, of course, emergency shelter, pocket knife, sun protection. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple here, water, water, water. Everybody, I wonder if any of you have heard the rule of threes, and it's we can live three minutes without air, three minutes, sorry, three days without water and three weeks without food, under the right conditions, of course. So we need water, make sure you take water, absolutely. Make sure you have something to build an emergency shelter with. Um, in Adventure Smart, we talk about the garbage bag. Um, we used to teach that. I know we don't use it as much now. And we, we really look at those uh, little foil blankets. They are amazing. Our members carry those. So as long as well as some expensive bivvies and that kind of a thing. One of the things I have up here about the communication devices. Have two. You need a backup. I don't know how many times I've been on a call out and one of the messages we get is, and they've got 8% on their battery. That was the last call out we got. And it's like, oh no. And this is somebody's lifeline. If you have cell service, of course. Um, there's other things you can have. And these, we don't, I don't support any one of these. These are just examples. Um, in reaches, the Garmin in reaches, and there's the spot devices. And, um, there's other navigational tools that you can get apps for your phone. Um, one of the ones I have pictured here is just the compass that is from your phone. And at the bottom, there are the coordinates of where you're located. Really important, get to know where your compass is and these coordinates because this will tell us where to find you. Um, yeah, make sure you have a backup. And the other thing is going into the mountains, going hiking, all of a sudden you get somewhere and you will not have cell service. Um, we don't have much out here in the Kootenai region, for sure, east and west. Um, we have some, well, we have lots, but when you head out into the back, it's not really reliable. Training, I loved this one. Come forth into the light things, let nature be your teacher. I went, oh my gosh, that's a great one, but you know, this is where we really need to get informed and get training. Do you have survival training? We train our members in survival. As a matter of fact, they have to go out overnight and um, with what they have in their pack, and it's just a survival pack, a ready pack, we call it in SAR, and they have to be able to build their shelter, build their fire, have food, and we do it for the whole weekend, so they train all day, so they're exhausted. Then they have to go build their shelter, sleep if they can, and uh, get up the next day and start training again. And this is something that we really teach because often our members have been stuck outside with subjects overnight. So they need to know how to take care of themselves and other people too. Um, what not to wear? No cotton. Oh my God, no cotton. We preach this again and again and again, and you cannot wear jeans. Absolutely not. Cotton, we say cotton kills, and it really does. Um, what it does is it doesn't dry quickly, and it's cold. It steals your heat. If you're going to go out, make sure you have the right clothing. You know, have something for rain. Have uh, proper hiking pants that wick the water away. Um, have proper footwear, something. Um, we have run into lots of people in flip-flops, little running shoes, and they're on rocky trails, and it's, yeah, not the greatest. What about the weather? Have you checked the weather before you go? Out here in the Kootenays, it's 34 degrees. It was actually 34 degrees on my back deck in the uh, shade today, and I can tell you right now, the top of Fisher Peak, which is one of the highest peaks in the Rockies in the area, uh, it was not. It was really, 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 really cold, and it was full-on snow up there. So by the time you get from the bottom to the top, it is cold. I've often put on my mitts and my toque because it's cold. Um, first aid, make sure somebody has first aid and knows what to do. 
um, hypothermia. So really, really, really important. Again, know the signs and symptoms because this is something that comes up on hikes. Uh, if you're in the rivers, the lakes, know the umbles. Though that is the first sign of hypothermia and go down, go look. Um, I love this one. Oh my God, I have to go down. The other night we were um, going through everything. Chris uh, has something to say about this too. Going up is easy because your center of gravity is forward. You're grabbing onto things and then you turn around and it's, oh my God, hardest place to go and often when accidents happen. So really know where you're going and look behind you before you go. Um, it's scary. Decision points. This is another place where we often see people get lost. Um, know where you're going. Flag it somehow, mark it, take a mental note. Signs are down after winter and they're not there. Do something so that you know where the decision point is because in the mountains, you don't mess around with that. That trail can lead you to a cliff band and you're not coming out of there, not without a rescue, so. Um, this is a little picture here of Mount Evans. This was a rescue that was done. We had a group of approximately seven people and they were um, all different abilities. And they ended up having two people that turned around to go back down. So at least there was two of them together and the rest of them went up to the top. And when they came back down, so the two people coming down made a left instead of a right when they came back, just out of pure disorientation, it, it's different coming back down. <coughs> Pardon me. And they spent the night overnight on the mountain and uh, this is one of the helicopters towing in uh, near the area they were and they were buried and um, in um, under trees and rocks and they saw the helicopters and they tried to signal but we couldn't see them it was really hard so they were rescued the next day but um, they were pretty worse for wear they were gentlemen in their 70s and um, they needed rescue quickly um, Backcountry roads, pretty significant around here. Doesn't matter if you're in the central Okanagan area or in the Kootenai region, we have resource roads and they are active logging roads. Know how to call on them because those logging trucks coming down, if there's no call on the radio, they're coming down and there's only places sometimes that you can float just a little bit. So um, you don't wanna run into them on a narrow, narrow road. Here's a picture um, right here of a canyon. This is the Finley Canyon, and we had uh, some people get high centered on this Bailey Bridge. As you can see, there's no railings. And uh, one of the people got out and it was dark and fell 80 meters into the river. Um, we never found him. And that's, this is the flip side of the coin. This is the hard part. We searched and searched and searched and we never, like I said, we never did find him. And um, none of us will forget that. And this has happened on the Finley a few times now. And uh, our volunteers go out with all their hearts to go find people and it's hard on everybody. So again, resource roads, training, know where you're going. This is an operation uh, my team and many of the teams out here in the Kootenai and the central regions have swift water teams. We have lots of rivers, lots of people on them, kayakers, rafters, everything. And um, we right here, we're trying to recover um, a piece of um, a clue, I guess you could say, for uh, a missing subject again. And this was a huge operation in order to uh, let that boat had to be lowered down, held, and we had two people in the boat, one holding onto the other as they reached into the water. And that water right there where it was, was flowing at probably about five to 8,000 pounds of pressure. So you can imagine trying to reach into the water um, was really difficult and it doesn't look that deep and it's not. But this is the deceptiveness of the rivers. They are gorgeous. You wanna canoe them, you wanna raft them. Do your research, definitely. Um, last year, uh, several of our SAR teams over here in the East Kootenai spent a month on the Kootenai River looking for a missing person. And after a month, we did find that person and um, right where that person went in, it looked 
great. Even the RCMP dive team came out because it looked okay. And as soon as they got underneath, it was like this. It was super dangerous. So again, it's that deceptiveness of the terrain and the areas. So get your training for sure. The trip plan. Oh my gosh, so important. This is one of the things we even talk about to our own members. And we have a system on our own team where people will, you know, text and it's like, hey, you know, heading up Lackett, be back by eight. And we call it the drop dead time. And um, that is the time that people give us. And it's like, yeah, if you haven't heard from us at all, dial 911. So we know where our members are. And we just practice that as a whole. We have other friends too. And we go out. When I, even when I go out riding with the horses, hey, I'm you know going for a ride and we're heading this way. We're going to Dry Lake um, because we've had a call out. So if nobody knows where you are or you're gone, there's nobody looking for you. So you've got to let somebody know. So important. And you should probably let two people know sometime if they're not, if the other person isn't that reliable perhaps. So just, just know who you're... Um, uh, sending your trip plan to. This gentleman here is uh, a guy that got stuck out in the top of the world provincial park area. He was way, 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 way up in the spring and uh, snow was really deep, snow was rotten, so you can just really go through it and um, he slid off the road and he was there for two days and finally somebody came along and it was actually a um one of the foresters that was working in the area and when he talked to the the person um they said that uh, they were fine you know that someone was going to come get them and, and everything would be okay so that the forester actually gave him food and water and stuff like that and then kept going and then when he got back he talk to that person the subject again and the subject's like no 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 really really it's okay so the forester made a mental note when he came out um he actually called he dialed 911 to let people know that there's somebody up there and he's not coming out and nobody's sure if anyone's going so we flew in at last light um and sure enough he was there and uh we convinced him to come out with us and uh, got him out of there and we found out, yeah, no one knew he was there, no one. And if that forester hadn't have come along, it might've been one of those catastrophic incidents because he was so, so far out and um, didn't have the proper training, didn't have the essentials, that sort of thing. So yeah, so we were lucky. Um, this helicopter made it back to its pad literally with one minute to go. Um, just some stats. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, in 2018, we had 1,320. Now, these are provincial stats. Um, and we had 1,320 operations in 2019, 1,705. And in 2020, 2,284. You can see it going up and up and up. And uh, I went through and pulled out the year to date just for our southeast area. So that's the east and west Kootenays. We have 127 already. That's a lot. And the central has 159. And the other day, um, COSAR, which is Central Okanagan Star, was talking about it's been their busiest month in their whole history. And I think it's 57 years or something like that. So um, people are out there, and which is awesome because, like I said, the outdoors are amazing. Love it. But definitely get your training. And if you don't, make sure you can call for help. One of the little things I just wanted to plug really quickly too is that search and rescue in BC and search and rescue in Canada, in fact, is no charge. Okay, there are private companies that do charge. Search and rescue does not. So if you dial 911, there's no charge for rescue. Not even for the helicopter, nothing. We come get you. So it's important to um, call early. Here's just a little graph I found on the government site, and I thought this was fantastic. This is 9192 way down on the left, and here is 2021 already. You can see us going up and up and up and up and up. And it's because people are accessing the backcountry more and more. And again, awesome. Love it. Um, 
little picture here. So I mentioned the horseback riding accident, not me, one of the ladies I was riding with. Horse spooked, got bucked off, and it was really interesting because um, one of the ladies I was working, I was riding with was retired RCMP, and there was me in search and rescue, and everybody was like, oh, she'll be okay, and she was on the ground, she was screaming, she was hurt. And um, and I'm like, nope, 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 don't move her. And actually we had a retired doctor with us as well. So it was perfect. The retired doctor and I attended and I, I actually just put my foot down and said, uh-uh, we are not moving this, this woman because of the mechanism of injury. And uh, I called 911 and guided Kimberly Search and Rescue in to come get me and my people. And um, we took her out to a helicopter and she was flown directly to um, the hospital. And it was later found out that she was actually quite seriously injured and um, having somebody come in to get her driving a pickup would have hurt her so badly. So again, here's just a lesson for all of us. And you know, one that I've been involved in and that is make sure you call 911 early. Don't, you know, don't hesitate to do that. And this is why we do this. This is a picture from the Jumbo Search and Rescue from about four or five years ago. This was widely televised. A uh, woman went uh, hiking up to Jumbo, which is in the Bugboos, and uh, she had her poodle with her, like a standard poodle. And uh, the uh, weather came in. There was actually a bit of a, this was August, and there was a bit of snow, and then there was fog. And she went to take the dog out, and she got turned around and got lost for three days. And she ended up going down the mountain. And one of the things I actually wanna say that's a good lesson for this one, don't move. Don't move um, because we'll get you. And actually this is one of those ones where she got out, Poodle got out, everybody was okay. And this is literally the moment where she got out of the helicopter and was hugging her husband. And uh, the other two people are two of our search managers, one from Caslow and one from uh, Cranbrook. So pretty cool. And here's a fun picture and I'm almost done here. Um, so our teams will do some, will help with some, I, I shouldn't even be saying this, but I'll probably get poked by uh, somebody, but we will help with animal rescue if necessary. Um, there's special conditions, so it's always worth the call to see what happens. But in the one, there's a little kitty in the uh, crate and that's me leaning over there and that's Squash. We uh, went and uh, recovered him on a training exercise because a bridge had washed out. So we went and got him. So we had a swift water practice. And then I can't remember this big guy's, um, he was a name, I think he's a cane corso, um, huge. And he was stuck on a cliff, stuck on a cliff. And so this is one of our members trying to give him a little water. And what you can't see or hear is the dog is growling his face off. So we got the member out of there. But um, yeah, search and rescue is pretty rewarding. And you know what? It's okay to call 911 and ask for us. You will never put us out ever. This is why we chose to do this. I always say it's the best volunteer gig around. And the last slide, of course, is download the, tree, the free trip planning app. Definitely. It's available on the App Store and on Google Play. So um, yeah, definitely do that and uh, leave it with somebody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, we do have a question here from Jacqueline in the audience. Are there techniques for going downhill for better footing? Uh, assuming we already have supportive footwear. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you know, this is one of those things, first of all, is to definitely know your limits. Um, uh, because again, you know, going up is easy, going down, you're, you're sometimes, you know, if you're afraid of heights, again, going up is not so bad. But if you're a little weirded out by it, going down, you can get dizzy. So you, there's hiking poles you could possibly get, bending your knees, staying low, um, lowering that center of gravity. Definitely, uh, just a couple of little techniques there. So, and just like I said, know your limits and stay within it. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, we definitely have a, another question. Um, can you elaborate on calling the logging trucks? Use a ham radio from Jennifer. Okay. 
Okay, so um, Jennifer, great question. Um, what it is, is we actually have the VHF radios. And uh, so you don't need a ham radio, definitely not. Those are expensive and licensed and all things will actually VS VHF are supposed to. So hopefully there's no Transport Canada people here. Um, but uh, what you wanna do is when you get onto the resource roads, there's often a huge sign that says, call on this channel. So you can buy these radios for $100, $99. And they actually work pretty well. And um, they, you know, you just keep them in the house, you charge them, take them when you go, and it'll explain right on the sign how to do it. And there's a couple of different ways. And uh, when you're heading up, you'll look at the sign, the kilometer marker, and it'll be um, uh, one up Bull River for two. So one kilometer going up for two vehicles. And sometimes we'll say, you know, when we get to the seven kilometer mark, it's seven up for two pickups. And that way, the logging truck coming down, they know we're at the seven kilometer mark and they're looking for two pickups. So, yeah. And you would do the same thing going down just to make sure that uh, you know where they are. And they're great guys. They will pull over into one of the little pullouts for you, too. So, um, really important. Yeah. Excellent. Um... And then we have a good one, a question here from Macus, and they're asking what information is essential on a 911 call? Does the content have a template or sort for a 911 call that we can use, like if they needed to call for help? No, there's no template, but each agency, when they answer the phone, so if it's BC Ambulance, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. And what I want to say to everybody is take a deep breath and answer the questions. They, it actually only takes about one minute although it feels like 10. So, but they go to, they have drop down menus and they're asking questions because they're looking to see, is this what essentially it's triage? Is this a heart problem? Is it, you know, a medium problem? Is it a broken leg? Is it, so they're, what they're trying to do is figure out what's needed. And one of the things you want to have ready is the coordinates of where you are. So it's great to have a verbal description. So I'm in the top of the world park up by Ram Creek Hot Springs, and here are my coordinates. They'll take that all down, and it gives us such a, a heads up for where you are. It's amazing. And then from there too, if you say those words, often what they'll do is go, oh, we need SAR. And so it's important that if you are in a backcountry area and you call BC Ambulance or you call for the RCMP, ask for SAR too and say, we're going to need SAR. We're way, we're way out. And they'll, they'll call us right away because sometimes there can be a delay. So it's important to know your coordinates, know the verbal description and ask for SAR as well. Excellent. That's all the audience uh, questions that we have. Um, I believe Sandra has a question for you as well. Hi, Wendy. Thanks. That was awesome. I made some notes and, and took some things down there. That's great. Um, for your group in your region, what do you find? Because mm -hmm. I know that other, other regions throughout the province um, are indicative to certain user groups that need search and rescue. So for you with Kimberly Saar, what do you find? Let's go winter and summer, if you could let us know. what What's kind of the mainstay user group for each of those seasons? Um, so are you talking uh, backcountry skiing, that sort of thing? Skiers, hikers, paddlers, uh, snowmobilers, what seems okay. to be the user group that needs uh, needs your help the most? Okay, uh, you know what, in our little area here, so we could go Kimberly, Cranbrook, it's often sledders, so snowmobilers. And uh, one of the things we've been finding though, um, you know, well, one of the things we're always talking about is the sleds that we have compared now, compared to 10 years ago, can go further, faster, and uh, way into the back country. And that's when things go wrong. One of the good things we've been finding is that sledders are really prepared now. They have the shovel, probe, and transceiver, and they know where they're going. So that at least is a really cool thing. So um, a really good thing. But yeah, so our sledders, for sure, in the winter, we have a little bit of backcountry skiing here. Um, but uh, it's mostly locals who know where to go and how to be safe. So there's the secret spots, so to speak, right? Uh, so I would say a sledders around here. And um, the other thing too, around here, we have Google Maps 
So people come out here and they use Google Maps and they end up in the backcountry and in places where the roads don't go through and they're in vehicles that shouldn't be on those backcountry roads, but Google Maps says it's a good road. So that is something we have. I think we do that every single year. We go rescue somebody like that. And then in the summer, uh, swift water has been on the rise. We have lots of kayak, rafting, that sort of thing. And um, lots of hiking in the area too. Lots of hiking and mountain biking. Downhill mountain biking um, has managed, we have a beautiful hill just uh, behind Kimberly called Bootleg. And uh, we've had a few accidents there now and it's an extreme sport and it is a gorgeous, gorgeous hill and course. And uh, yeah, those seem to be our user groups that we are attending to. Thanks, Wendy. That helps me. I know that I have access to what you enter, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what steers and helps me strategize. So thank you for all of your administration work as well as response and everything else you do, because without that data, um, it, it leaves me to steer a ship a, a little bit blindly. So it's so important that all of the search and rescue volunteers, all 2,500 of you, yes. take that time to put the special information in there, the detailed information. And I say this because it allows me then and my crew to strategize and plan and coordinate specific messaging for those user groups, those seasons. This is why, and, and just to let the viewers know as well, this is why I strategically place our outreach crews in different regions of the province for the winters and summers. So we know, and you do too, Wendy, that this is um, uh, summertime hikers southwest. We know that. Uh, winter time, we know in that East Kootenays area that it slatters, and that's why my crew last winter was based in Revelstoke for the first time in Revy. Perfect. So it's really incredible. Yeah, it's it's great. And and you know, as we close your session here, Wendy, thank you so much. It's it's so insightful to hear what you have to say, and and I think the viewers really like to hear from yourself and others who are out there doing what you do. So thank you again for all that you've done, um, and that you how and how the how much energy you spend in training others, because I know your busy <laughs> bee and uh, supporting the system in our province in your region in our province and right across the country thanks wendy well, thank you thank you for having me tonight i really appreciate it awesome well as we jump on to our next guest i'd like to introduce to you uh chris he's with uh, acmg and ifmga a mountain guide uh, and as well a ski instructor and ski coach he's also a professional member of the canadian avalanche association Chris has spent over 35 years working as a trainer and examiner for the ACMG certification program. He's worked with a number of different organizations over the years, including Canadian Mountain Holidays, Yam Nusaka, if I pronounced that right, Chris, sorry, Mountain Adventures, and TRU, Thompson River University. The aspect of his profession that he enjoys the most is helping others develop the skills required to safely enjoy outdoor activities and adventures. Chris lives in Canmore, beautiful part of the country, uh, and is there with his wife, two cats, and a dog. Chris, welcome. And for the viewers here, Chris is without a camera tonight, so you get to hear his lovely voice and, and see his slideshow. So if you wanted to cue that up, we're, we're good to go, Chris. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much. Um, just want to double check here. Are people seeing my screen here? Can I just get some feedback from somebody? Yeah, we can see that, Chris. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, good evening, everybody from uh, lovely Canmore. Um, that was a great introduction. It covers many of the things that I was going to say, so that'll I, I can just move through a little bit quicker here. Um, as was mentioned, I, um, I'm an Association of Canadian Mountain Guides, uh, mountain guide, and an internationally recognized through the IFMGA. Um, this has been my life. This is pretty much what I've done uh, for all of my years, and I've enjoyed. I, you know, sometimes the the the, uh, the work can be difficult work. It can be stressful work, but if you ever talk to a guy that doesn't enjoy his work and doesn't think he's got one of the best jobs in the world, he or she has one of the best jobs in the world, you might want to go look for a different guy because it is, it's a great profession. Um, I've learned a lot of things over the years and one of the key aspects um, is the idea that we don't want to have to have a rescue. 
And I think it was great. It's a great segue uh, to uh, talk about the nature of rescue and what happens, because we all do make errors from time to time. Um, but if we can plan properly, hopefully, hopefully, we won't need a rescue and we can have a safe adventure. So what I'd like to do is start off with a, 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 um, a quote here. To have a great adventure and survive requires good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience, of course, is the result of poor judgment. And I've had lots of experience, lots. All right, so what I'd like to do tonight is talk about planning a backcountry trip. And if we, I'm just, uh, give me a second here, I just wanna pick my cursor. So by picking the right trip, the correct trip for the group and the conditions, it's fundamental to planning a safe adventure, all right? So I'm gonna cover each one of those areas over the next little while. So probably the most important safety tool we have, and a lot of, uh, there are a number of different uh, tools talked about in the last presentation, very important, uh, hardware and things like that, but in a lot of ways it's software and that's the most important. And I would suggest that uh, the, um, uh, a gentleman, Bruce Jameson, uh, who's one of the foremost avalanche researchers in Canada. I went to a session of his a number of years ago, and uh, it was very similar to this, but it was talking about avalanches. So it, um, a different time of the year, but uh, similar concepts in terms of preparation. And so this is Bruce Jameson here, um, and he's just a very, very talented individual and uh, with a, a lot of experience. <laughs> There's that word again. And what he said is if all recreational, and I'm just paraphrasing here, so don't quote me if you happen to know uh, Bruce, uh, if all recreationalists had the equivalent of a guides meeting prior to a backcountry trip, instance, incidents would likely be reduced. So what that means is that guides get together. We get together on a regular basis. Uh, this is a guides meeting here at CMH. They get together at Canadian Mountain Holidays, the Heli Ski Company. They'll get together every morning, and those meetings can go on for a very long time. If the weather's poor and there's a high avalanche hazard, they might be a little bit quicker if weather's been stable for a period of time. And there will be ongoing meetings during the day where the guys will talk about conditions, et cetera, and continue to make decisions. And this is one of the most important aspects of our, um, or one of the most important safety tools, and one of the most important aspects of risk management. So uh, my suggestion here and where I'm going with this is that uh, the um, general public recreationalists can do this also. So what I'm gonna do is uh, look at the trip plan and meetings and we're going to look at the uh, pre-trip planning and research. So that's a meeting prior to your trip. All right, and that's an opportunity for you to come up with an idea where you want to go, how long it's going to take, and I'll talk more about that later, but that's imagining your trip and making sure it's an appropriate one. Then a trip meeting, and that'll be usually a meeting the morning of your trip because you need to get together with everybody. There's a number of aspects that need to be discussed at that point in time, looking at options and making sure that your original plan is going to work. And then you're going to have field meetings throughout the day. And just keep in mind that these meetings, it sounds like a very formal word, but these often are quite informal. Excuse me. Um, and this is the decision making on the trip that you're going to be doing. So we'll start off with the trip planning and research meeting. And uh, this is, you get your folk, everybody gets together and um, Things are obviously a little different now in times of COVID, but um, uh, as things improve, you can probably be doing these meetings at somebody's home. Uh, right now, Zoom is a great way when, and uh, the same sort of thing we're doing right now. I'm pretty sure everybody here probably has some experience with Zoom. Maybe it's going to be in a coffee shop. Hopefully we'll be able to do that fairly soon. 
So this is your opportunity to kind of get together with your group. Now, a lot of people start with the trip that they want to do first. And what I'm going to suggest is that might be a little bit backwards. So here's a way that I would suggest doing it. First of all, take a look at the group composition. So what's the general fitness and experience? There might be quite a variety of fitness and experience. Maybe you've got some highly fit individuals. Maybe some people aren't that fit. Maybe you've got some great experience in the group and other people that are doing it for the first time. So you need to have a good idea of what that um, fitness and experience levels are within the group. And then group size. And this for me is a big um, issue, this group size. Um, the larger groups are often more difficult to manage. It's more difficult to make decisions with larger groups. There's more things that can go sideways. There's more opportunity to gain more experience in a sense. So be cautious about group size. Now, there is no perfect size. I kind of like a big enough group that if something goes wrong, you've got some support, some backup, um, but not so large that it becomes unwieldy to manage everything. So, um, you know, there is no perfect size. I kind of like when I'm going out personally, groups of three or four seem to be a real nice number. And the other is to look at risk tolerance. Now, we all have different risk tolerance. And if you're going to have a group of 20-year-old males, they're probably going to have a much higher risk tolerance, a much higher propensity towards risk than, say, a mixed gender group in their 50s. So that's also going to be an, um, one of the things you'll want to take into account when you're doing your planning, risk tolerance. The other is group goals. So one of the second things I'd be looking at in my pre-trip planning and research is group goals. The goals need to be shared by the whole group. If you have a number of different, excuse me, if you have a number of different goals within the group, it's likely that you're gonna have trouble on the trip because everybody's gonna have a different idea of what they want to do. So you may, the group may start splitting up and you may start losing control and maybe some of the less experienced people may be left on their own. So for example, if uh, this is a skier, but you might have somebody, just hold on a sec, I've got a cat that just is cat bombing me right now, so I'm just gonna move them out the there we go. That's one of the two cats and a dog. Uh, you might have some people that are very um, summit oriented, summit or plummet. So that individual or groups are really keen on getting, uh, doing a hard trip, getting up to the top of something. Then you may also have uh, folks that are more of the stop and smell the roses type that are enjoying spending some time with uh, looking at nature, looking at birds, looking at what it, um, the flowers, etc. And this group, the two groups might not be that compatible. So again, looking at those goals, it's difficult to make consensus, consensus decisions when goals are incompatible. The third area, condition reports. So um, when you're starting to figure out where you want to go, you have to get an idea of what the weather is going to be like, what the conditions are like in the mountains in the, uh, or wherever you happen to be going on your trip. So um, if you're in the winter, if you're going snowshoeing or tu touring, you'll want to know what the Avalanche Bulletin is. And uh, that can be um, gotten through Avalanche Canada. Uh, if you're um, in the summertime, a lot of places have um, uh, trail reports. And this is one I just pulled from the Icefields Parkway. This isn't in, in the Kootenays, I'm afraid. But many areas do have these um, uh, trail reports. And you can sometimes pick them up through social media, too. So it's a little bit of your research. Another part is to look in, at the weather forecast. What are we going to be looking at over the next little while? Are we going to be getting rain? Are we going to be getting sun? Or in the, and of course, if we're in Canada, are we going to be getting snow even in the summertime? So getting an idea of the weather, and that'll help you pick the trip a little bit better. And looking at current conditions, what's it like out right now? And what do we expect to see once we get out there? Is it going to be rain? Is it going to be snow? So once you've got all of these put together, you have your group composition, you have your group goals, you have your conditions report, and now it's time to plan your trip rather than the other way around.
So many people start here with the TRIP plan and then shoehorn in the rest of these aspects. So what I'm suggesting here is that uh, good planning beforehand, figuring out these three will help you with your TRIP plan. So when you're looking for TRIP plan, now you have an idea of what the group composition is. So you can pick a terrain difficulty that's appropriate for the conditions in the group. You can do some research looking at root books and decide upon the trip. Um, you can find a lot of stuff now on the web and social media. Just be careful with some of that. Uh, some of it is inaccurate and some of it isn't intentionally inaccurate, but isn't well described. So it's just a bit of a warning there. Always take it with a grain of salt. Then you need to do your route plan and options. And some of the stuff that I would include in my route plan and options are the distance traveled, so I would have some sort of a map that I could look at, either online or a paper map, look at the elevation gain, look at the time that it's going to take overall, and I'll show you something later that'll help you um, uh, figure that out, how long it's going to take to do your trip based on distance and elevation gain and the type of trails, etc what the overall difficulty is, any hazards you might be encountering along the way, creek crossings, things like that, and key decision points. Are there places where you have a fork in the trail? Are there places where you might want to decide, huh, we're too late in the day, we need to turn around and go back from here because we're going to be very committed if we go any further. And that's sort of uh, the next point here, having some sort of a turnaround time so that uh, you don't go too late on your trip and then find yourself in the dark coming back and then possibly need a rescue or needing that headlamp that was mentioned earlier. Leave a copy, this was also mentioned, leave a copy of your plan with a contact, at least one copy, so that if you don't come back in time, then those people can uh, get a hold of uh, search and rescue and they can start looking for you. Okay, morning of the trip. So this can happen in a coffee shop, again, once hopefully once uh, we got beyond the uh, COVID restrictions. It may be a tailgate meeting, uh, maybe where you're uh, starting out with your carpooling or the trailhead, all right? So this is the morning of. And you've already made your trip plan, so now what you can start doing is looking through uh, committing to your proposed trip. You need to meet and review wellness within the group. How's everybody feeling? Any bulletins, warnings, anything like that that you might need to, uh, to uh, take into account? Uh, what the current, what the weather forecast is, and what the current conditions are. Has it been raining a lot? Uh, are the uh, it might be nice right now, might be sunny, but maybe it rained all night and the trails are going to be very muddy, very wet, and the creeks are going to be somewhat higher. Make sure you have the equipment you need, both personal and group. You would have organized that prior in your pre-trip meeting. And uh, then a review of your route plan. Make sure that uh, everybody knows where they're going and that you've oriented yourself to the surrounding terrain. Make sure you have options. If you only have one plan, you're likely to do that plan, even if it's inappropriate. But if you've got options, then you can go, ah, Weather's about much different than we thought, it's much wetter, maybe we better pick a shorter trip. Uh, leader, that's always a hard one. Um, if in smaller groups, sometimes you may not need a leader, a group of two or three, but if you get into larger groups, it's an advantage to have a leader, somebody to help organize. That doesn't mean they're leading on the trail necessarily, but they, they can organize any sort of meeting that's necessary. And if there is an accident, you've got somebody that can take charge and organize the rest of the group. Okay, is your plan still good? So here, what you wanna do is make sure that all the planning that you've done is actually works now. Is it still a good plan? You know, given all these other aspects that you've looked at. All right, so once you've decided, it's time to go. All right, so you can go on your trip. And then during that, you might wanna have a few field meetings and here's some of the areas that I would suggest you look at. Three key strategies, pace, and that's pace of the day, not just how fast you're walking, but your overall pace. So it needs to be appropriate for the group and objective. Often people hike too fast, they get in a bit of a race uh, with the other people on the, um, uh, in, in the trip, uh, on the hike. So it has to be one that you can maintain all day 
or for the length of the trip, okay? And it's appropriate for the group. So it might be a fairly fast pace, you've got very fit individuals, or it might be a little more sedate. So you need to manage that speed. Make sure you get appropriate breaks for food and water uh, so that you can keep your energy up through the day. And that's often, you know, maybe taking a break every hour for five to 10 minutes, and that's pretty common. And then you'll have considerably more energy and you'll probably actually move faster by having those breaks. And make sure you maintain your momentum also. Uh, one of the things that can happen is you start having too long of breaks and then it's hard to get up and get going again, but you keep on with your original plan, even though your momentum has uh, uh, slowed down and maybe your time plan isn't so good anymore. So maintain that momentum. Stay together. This is probably one of the biggest issues we've seen over the years is that groups split up. Somebody takes off very fast, other people are much slower, and they have difficulty keeping up with the pace. You can split the group if you make plans about that beforehand. Maybe, for example, you decide, wow, we've got two objectives. Uh, we can have one group that moves a little faster to the upper lake, the second group moves a little bit slower to the lower lake, and then the upper first group comes back and we all meet again at the lower lake. Uh, manage transitions. Uh, what I'm looking at here, this is, this is probably for, in my industry, this is one of the biggest issues is managing transitions. And there's all kinds of transitions every day. It can be a transition in terrain. Maybe it's going to get steeper. Maybe it's going to get, uh, all of a sudden you're going downhill rather than going uphill. These are all uh, terrain transitions. You need to manage them. And sometimes you might have to stop, talk about them and work them out. For example, here they've moved into a much more difficult piece of terrain. It's become rocky. So now they're going to have to manage it a little bit better. And as was mentioned earlier, make sure that they can also come back down that same terrain. And one of the, uh, it was mentioned briefly, but I'd like to, to mention again, uh, especially if you don't have a good trail and that you're doing a bit of root finding, always look behind you because the terrain will look very different on the way down than it did on the way back. So learn to recognize, memorize the terrain for the way down. Uh, if you get a change in conditions or weather, and uh, yep, these guys are hiking in the summer. And this is not unusual for us, especially at higher elevations, to get snow at all time of year. You could get a rainstorm coming in, high winds. And when that happens, you need to decide whether it's appropriate to keep going, what sort of uh, um, risk mitigation you can do, for example, putting on more clothing, et cetera. Um, anytime you come upon a hazard, how are you going to manage a hazard? Do you even want to manage the hazard or is the way around the hazard? Is there a fork in the trail? Rather than just going off willy-nilly down whichever fork you hit, like my dog does, um, what you probably want to do is spend a little bit of time, get the map out, make sure that you know which part, which trail to go down. And also manage individual group and energy dynamics. Often what you may find during a trip, especially a longer one, or if people are less fit or you've been moving too quick, is that the energy drops very quickly. And then all of a sudden, you've got people that aren't making good decisions and also um, uh, people that are getting tired and may have difficulty if the weather gets worse. So monitor those group dynamics energy. Uh, and at that point, stop, regroup, assess, and learn to manage, figure out how to manage. Consensus decision making. This is a big one these days. Even in mountain guides are doing much more consensus decision making. We're sharing decision making with our guests, with our clients. So everyone shares the risk. Everyone has a say. That's very, very important. And uh, Never let somebody else make decisions for you. Always have some involvement in that decision making. And it may just be a matter of asking appropriate questions, but everybody needs to be involved and you have to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to have their say. Um, evaluate and manage. I just put this out here. This is an, a, a card that's used in the winter. It's an evaluator. We couldn't come up with any idea for a summer one, but this is a concept that you sort of want to go through all the different aspects of the day, um, looking at the dangers that you might be encountering, how everybody's doing, all those kinds of things, and that'll help you evaluate and manage. And uh, 
when you're at that point too, it's a good idea to look at your various options. And one of the things that we use a lot in our industry is a veto. And if somebody really feels that something isn't appropriate and has a good reason and want to veto and say, for example, we shouldn't go there, we should turn around and go back, it's too late in the day. Even if other people are feeling pretty good about it, maybe that person is a little more tired uh, and a little less comfortable with it and their veto is should be recognized. So that's something you can decide on. I wouldn't say that it's a, necess a necessity. Uh, it is a bit of a um, uh, common practice in our, um, uh, in the guiding profession. Never be frightened to turn around. Mountains will always be there. So um, I just want to double check here. Uh, my time looks like it's pretty near up. Should I go through resources here? Do I have time for that? Or do you want to go into questions? You have a couple of minutes for resources. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I've only got one or two questions at the moment, so we can definitely talk a little bit more about resources. Thanks, Chris. Okay, a uh, few things for resources then. Uh, weather resources, uh, the uh, national and local, these are great for a good overview. And of course, there's, you know, the, you have your um, government offices, the weather network, et cetera. Um, if you ever follow these, you'll often find that they're not always accurate, but it's still worth looking, and they tend to be more accurate closer to the day. They're very poor at um, forecasting into the future uh, in the mountains. Uh, In-depth, Avalanche Canada, and I do, um, I will have a link at the end here where uh, it will show you the Avalanche Canada uh, URL for their site and they have a year-round um, uh, weather and this is really good weather it's very well down done it's custom made for them and actually it has a um, it's better even for uh, BC than it is for the uh, Rockies here so it's a very good weather forecast very specific one and I'll have a um, uh, a link for this uh, in the final uh, slide for you is spot weather. We use this all the time. I can take and move this spot around to a place and click on it and then I'll get a number of different forecasts for that area and I'll I figured out over time what is the best off in this first one right off the bat and this will give you at first it looks horrible it looks like how can I possibly understand this but if you work with it for a while it's excellent and it's very similar to what pilots might get so it'll give you the temperature range for the day uh, precipitation and clouds for the day um, and wind and pressure for different elevations so very, very useful. And another one that a lot of people never think about is webcams. And there's webcams everywhere in the mountains. And this one just happens to show a ski area. One of the things I wanted to show here is a lot of webcams will actually have information at the top here. For example, it tells me what the temperature is at this particular elevation. So even if I'm not going here uh, to uh, Lake Louise, I can sort of get, well, this is at the, uh, um, uh, 2,400 meter elevation. So that's probably going to be con fairly consistent across part of the area that I might be going to. And there are also a uh, number of areas have remote, I'm just showing Parks Canada here. They have remote weather stations, uh, telemetry set up that'll give you all kinds of information about wind, snowfall, temps. So you can start getting a lot of information. These are kind of the secrets that guides have, uh, not secrets, but it's the kind of stuff we use all the time. Uh, just a little bit on navigation. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, map and compass. I'm keen on maps, paper maps. I love those things. They're really good for showing the big picture. You can see everything laid out. Um, however, it's also useful to have a GPS and you can use that for route planning, location. Uh, excellent for that, especially if you're a little bit geographically embarrassed. And then Google Maps, boy, you know, we we're talking about the difficulty with Google Maps, but Google Earth is fantastic and you can do a lot of planning. There's a lot of very good applications that you can work with Google Maps. Okay, I mentioned earlier that uh, I'd have a little bit of a, um, uh, a suggestion for you for figuring out your time. So you can, uh, if, for example, if you have just a paper map, 
take a piece of string, go along with uh, your string from where you're going and where you start to where you're going. There's a little scale at the bottom of your map, figure out how many kilometers. And generally on a good trail, we'll travel somewhere between three to five kilometers per hour. Usually we'll give ourselves one hour per 300 meter of elevation gain, a uh, thousand foot for any of you folks that are still thinking in uh, imperial terms. And generally for a full day, we'd be looking to one to two hours for breaks. So that'll help give you a bit of a, uh, an idea whether your plan is appropriate. A lot of people pick off uh, far too difficult a trip for themselves. Log your trips and keep track of your travel time. So logging trips is really useful uh, you, because you forget over time. So you might want to go back there. So you've logged that, you know a little bit about the trip, how long it took, any issues that you might have had. And then keep track of your travel times. That'll help you come up with a better sort of um, travel rate. Okay. And this was already mentioned, so I'm going through it very quick. Have a minimum of two devices that can contact rescue services. Uh, one of them uh, might lose battery or one of them might get broken, uh, or it might be with somebody that actually needs the rescue and uh, it's not available. So the cell phones are great uh, if you have coverage in the area and there's a lot of things you can do with your cell phone. GPS can be also uh, put on through various apps. Uh, this was mentioned, this is a, a VHF radio. Uh, professionals use this all the time. You need to have the uh, frequencies. So the great, you can get those frequencies on logging roads that actually gives you that. But a lot of the uh, rescue services, for example, do have frequencies. They're sometimes a little bit hard to get a hold of, um, but that's one of the tools that we use. In reach and spot, these are things that are avail very available. I strongly recommend that they be at least one per group, either a spot, or an in reach. And these are subscription services and they work off a of satellite. And uh, you basically, you just sort of click help. It's a 911 type thing. It'll go to a, uh, a service center and then they'll do a call out to the nearest um, search and rescue for you. Okay. Um, group books, obvious. And I'll just quickly, we have a series of pamphlets. I'll give you a quick um, uh, URL to that. Uh, the Adventure Smart Trip Planner, et cetera. That's uh, very, very useful to have that. So that would be very, very, uh, that would fit right in with what the um, I was suggesting earlier about the trip plan. Social media, just the caution I mentioned earlier. So the links that you, uh, down here, uh, this is the, um, uh, if you go to www.acmg.ca forward slash expo forward slash, and it'll have links to the resources I talked about. So that's me. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, definitely have a couple questions uh, from the audience. We have one from Sandra. Um, as a guide, who are your clients mainly? Are they experienced people, unaware people, locals, tourists, international people? All of those. So we, we do, um, what you'll find is that guiding, uh, there, it sort of breaks down into two types. One uh, is instructional. So we'll run uh, all kinds of instructional courses from beginner courses, beginner rock climbing, beginner ski touring, beginner hiking courses. Uh, and that would be a large part. That's a large bulk of the work that we do is instructional. And I would say that it's peer middle. We get lots of people that are starting out, are new to the sport or the activity. And as we move up that pyramid, uh, to more and more experienced people, we get uh, less and less people there. So somebody who wants to hire a guy to do a very hard rock climb, uh, there would be less there than you would, for example, for uh, just learning how to rock climb in the first place. Our clients come from all over the world, not right now, but hopefully uh, by the summer and certainly next winter, they come from just about everywhere. Um, instructional courses, I would say, are primarily local people and guided type courses are more likely or guided trips are more likely to be international uh a lot of people from the u.s and uh, a lot of folks from europe too so hopefully that answered your question that is excellent and then just actually a little bit of a follow-up to that one uh should the average hiker hire a guide you, oh that's a great question um the 
I think it really depends. What what I would actually suggest, and um, allow me just to go to this next one, um, is that uh, one of the things I would suggest is that uh, you take a first aid course and that you take a backcountry travel course. And you can certainly hire a guide. And the great thing about a guide is that um, they can do, they'll pick a great trip for you and you'll have a wonderful time on the trip uh, because they've, they're probably quite familiar with it. They'll be very good at the pacing, et cetera. However, having said that, um, it's also, I encourage people to get the skills they need, build up um, their personal resume with uh, easy trips to start with and uh, progress through that to more difficult trips over time. Hopefully uh, that answers the question there. That's perfect. Thank you so much once again, Chris. Great. Thanks, Chris. I, I've just come back on and uh, even though we couldn't see you, it was a pleasure to hear what you had to say. I was making notes again and, and coming up with all sorts of ideas. So you might hear from me again in the near, near future <laughs> for a few extra of those resources. 35 years definitely spoke clearly across with your slides and what you had to share. It was it was a, a true pleasure to hear what you've had to say. And I can still hear that enthusiasm, that passion, that energy that you bring. So, you know, the love of the outdoors is is definitely uh, felt through the screen, even though we didn't get to see you. So maybe next time we get to, to see your face as you, as you share with us. But, you know, that was a great addition to what Wendy had shared and it kind of complimented on a few things. Loved your description there and how you um, composed that with gathering and all the group dynamics. That's a biggie. And I know I have a lot of conversations with that when I do our social media engagement. And that group dynamic thing is a big one. We just had a post recently about risk and it was it was also about that evaluation and analysis and, and assessment. So um, but those finer details of the group dynamics is, is a big one that I love. So. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up with you, Chris, and move on to uh, to Vanessa, but hopefully you stick around and uh, I will be in touch. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. As we move on to our last uh, speaker for tonight, and I'm really excited to to introduce you to Vanessa um, with Wild Safe BC. Uh, Wild Safe BC is the provincial leader in preventing conflict with wildlife through collaboration, education and community solutions. Wild Safe PC evolved out of the highly successful Bearware program, which you might have been familiar with, and is owned and delivered by the British Columbia Conservation Foundation. Their motto is keeping wildlife wild and communities safe. Vanessa uh, and I have worked together over the years, and she's been a part of the Wild Safe BC program um, for over the last five years and has been the provincial coordinator since 2018. She has a BC BSc in ecological restoration and a degree in applied ecology with a focus on fish and wildlife management. Sounds exciting. She enjoys her time exploring the outdoors, both on land and in the water, and is only taking photos out there and leaving footprints. Vanessa, I'm so glad you're here tonight to help us. I'm sure they have lots of questions, hopefully, and we're excited to hear about wildlife, bears, and whatever else you need to add. So welcome aboard and the screen is all yours. Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, can everybody see my presentation? Yes, I can see. Thanks, Vanessa. Excellent. So thanks for that great introduction, Sandra. And uh, yes, I was scribbling down some notes myself. So great presentations uh, this evening so far. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really great privilege to be a part of this. Um, I'm based out of uh, Kamloops and on the traditional territory of the Tecumseh Sequibit Nation. Uh, it's been a beautiful weather out here and I hope everybody's enjoying this evening and, and this presentation. Um, what I'm going to start with is um, a little bit about the program. So Sandra did a really good job of summarizing uh, our program, which is delivered by the BC Conservation Foundation, which is a registered charity. And we do a lot of activities in the province. We have over 30 coordinators uh, working in the, pro in the province, delivering to over 100 communities. And they do activities such as door-to-door -door outreach, uh, presentations for youth, uh, wildlife and wilderness and safety presentations. You're gonna get a little snapshot of that tonight. Uh, we do bear spray workshops. So if you have a coordinator in your community, uh, be sure to sign up for one of these free workshops. Uh, we do boost the community events and we also focus on educating people around attractant management which is one of the leading causes of conflicts with wildlife and we have some innovative approaches such as the wild safe bc business pledge and our bear campsite program which we just launched last year 
So why does our program exist? Well, BC is wildlife country. Uh, we have some of the highest densities of large carnivores in North America. So we have an estimated 3,500 cougars, really rough estimate, but some of the highest densities. Uh, we have more wolves in British Columbia than all of the Southern United States combined. Uh, in British Columbia, we have a quarter of the uh, population of grizzly bears in North America at around 15,000. And we also have some of the highest densities of black bears in North America, ranging from 140 to 250,000. It is recognized that these animals play an important ecological role in the landscape. Uh, they have spiritual value for many indigenous people, and they have an intrinsic value. However, they can present a real and perceived threat to people, pets, livestock, and property. So reducing the factors that lead to conflicts and adopting proven practicing practices when sharing the landscape with animals is a key strategy and leads to safer coexistence for all. Recreation in bear country is increasing, and as the number of search and rescue reports and call-outs are increasing, so are the number of interactions of people on the landscape uh, with wildlife. Uh, for all the millions of visitors in bear country and wildlife country in BC, the number of negative interactions are still relatively low, but it is important to do what we can to mitigate those risk factors. Worldwide, over 50% of attacks occur when people are actually engaged in recreational activities, and many of them are encounters with female bears and with their cubs, especially grizzly bears or brown bears, which are both the same species. There was a uh, review of Sears bear attacks in British Columbia over 37 years. This was published in 1999. And it was really informative because it gave us an indication of what were the leading factors that resulted in attacks of bears on people. And they found that the people that were most vulnerable were small parties of one to two people. Um, one of the reasons is because small parties tend to make less noise. So it's really important not to surprise a bear. You want them to be aware of your presence. And the best way to do that is to make noise with your voice. Um, Many of the grizzly bear encounters and attacks were close range encounters. So it was the surprise encounter. Uh, very often involved a sow grizzly bear with cubs. So grizzly bears, unlike black bears, they evolve differently. Grizzly bears evolved in open landscapes. So they're more likely to stand their ground. Grizzly bears also invest an additional year in raising their offspring. And they're one of the slowest reproducing mammals, land mammals in North America. So they invest a lot in protecting their offspring. And usually they're protecting them from other bears which want to kill the cubs and then mate with that female again. So female sows and cubs are often avoiding other male dominant bears. Also, grizzly bears will protect a carcass. It is a very important and valuable source of protein. So if you encounter a kill or carcass, it could be a cougar kill, it could be a grizzly bear kill. It's really important to leave that area immediately. And there are predatory bear attacks. They are luckily very rare. Very often they're underlying circumstances. Uh, with black bear predatory attacks, they're almost always male. And um, this is the leading cause of serious black bear attacks is when it's a predatory male bear. However, with grizzly bears, those serious injuries and encounters can often be a sow with cubs and it's a defensive attack. She's not trying to kill you, she's just trying to protect and remove a threat. So understanding the differences in behaviors is really important to become informed and familiar about how bears behave and how you actually uh, deflect and prevent an attack just by the way you respond appropriately in an encounter. So the first step is to know that the best bear encounter is the one you avoid. So you wanna watch for signs, uh, become familiar with what bears eat. Like they are 80% of their diet is actually plant-based. Um, insects, larvae are a really important part of food source, protein source for them. So if you see overturned uh, stumps and they're fresh, that could be signs of bear activity in the area. Fresh tracks, when it's muddy out or if you're along a stream bank, you're seeing fresh tracks, that's a good indication. Be able to tell the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear track can also be very helpful. Looking for fresh claw marks on trees, um, 
if there's scavengers in trees that are an indication of a carcass nearby or if there's a bad smell. Looking for fresh scat, if there's fresh scat on the trail, that might be an indication that you're in uh, bear habitat and you might, might give you an indication whether you continue on that trail or not or seek a different route. Recognizing what bear habitat might look like. So some of the most prized foods for bears are huckleberry bushes and blueberry bushes. So if you're in a berry patch, there could be a bear feasting on those berries nearby. So be very cognizant of that. It's really important when you're doing recreation activities in bear country that you don't wear earbuds. You need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to hear the sounds around you. If there's crackling branches, you want to be aware if there is a bear nearby. So you can't hear that if you're wearing, listening to music. You want to make noise with your voice. Bear bells are not known to be effective. Stores do sell them still, but that high-pitched metallic noise bears do not associate with people, and it doesn't penetrate very far into the forest. So it's actually better to use your voice. Uh, when I'm recreating and I'm by myself, I will actually play music on my phone and sing along to that just because it's a reminder to keep making noise as I'm moving along. If you mountain bike, you're recreating at high speed and relatively quietly. And it's really important, again, to be aware around blind corners or coming up over rises. To, you know, there could be a bear, there could be people hiking or walking their dogs on that same trail. And bike trails are often paths of least, least resistance for bears, and they may want to just use that travel corridor. So you don't want to collide with a bear on your mountain bike. So be aware, slow down, especially when your sight lines are limited dogs. So they found that there was a review of black bear attacks in North America and they found that over 50% of the time a dog was involved. So bears will see a dog as a potential threat to their offspring and with some animals it might be seen as potential prey. So with wolves they might see your dog, they're very territorial, as a potential threat or potential prey. So it's really important to be a responsible dog owner and don't let dogs off leash chasing after wildlife. If a dog chases after a bear, sometimes a bear may, may run off, but very often as well, it'll bring that angry bear back on you because that where the, that's where the pet's gonna come. The pet's gonna come back to you as the owner for safety. So it's really important to keep your pets on a leash and under control when you're in bear country. And bear country is just about everywhere in British Columbia. When you're camping, it's really important not to bring anything that has a scent or an odor into your tent. That includes toiletries, toothpaste, deodorant, even, even insect repellent. Anything that has a strong odor may cause a bear to come investigate. You want to keep those things stored well outside the tent in a bear-resistant bear canister. And you can go to websites such as WildSafeBC or IGBC, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee, and they'll have lists of certified bear resistant containers. Uh, on our website, we link back to IGBC. So if you just go to wildsafebc.com, you'll find those, those two links. So we launched the Bear Campsite Program last year based on a very successful model developed by Parks Canada. And we're hoping to implement this in private campgrounds, municipal campgrounds, and hopefully in collaboration with BC Parks as well. And the idea is, keep a bear when you're not there or when you're sleeping and that means putting everything away and making sure it's stored either in a hard side vehicle or in a food locker you don't want bears accessing anything at a campground because that can lead to what we call either food conditioning whereas they receive a food reward and learn to associate people with sources of food or it can also lead to human habituation where they just get comfortable being around people and activities, which increases that level of safety risk. When, you, when there's more bears in your vicinity and they get accustomed to people, your interactions are increasing and that interaction for a negative encounter is increasing. It's better and safer for all wildlife and predators such as wolves and bears for them to, to maintain that natural wariness of people and to keep that distance. That makes it safer. So this is a quick overview of how to react in a bear encounter. The most important thing you need to remember is never run. Running can trigger a chase response in any predator and they might not even be interested in you but you, they see you run away and now all of a sudden it's a trigger for them to, to chase. 
So you need to act like a human and not like prey. And you wanna make sure you stand your ground. So that's rule number one. Here's a few different kinds of bear encounters that you might experience. A bear that is unaware. The most important thing is if you encounter a bear that's not aware of your presence, don't make your presence known. Don't call out. Don't try to get a picture. Don't try to get closer. Back away quietly, keeping an eye on the bear and go back the way you came. A bear that is aware of your presence. So you wanna make sure the bear knows that you're a human and that you're not a threat. So you're gonna speak softly to the bear. You're not gonna yell at it or try to scare it off. Don't try to provoke an attack. That bear may really not be interested in you. It may be grazing on vegetation and that's its primary uh, role right now is forage for food. So if you encounter a bear that is aware of your presence, whether it's a black bear or a grizzly bear, you wanna just speak softly and calmly and back away slowly. Again, avoid the temptation to run and do not turn your back. You want to, you want to keep an eye on it and don't make direct eye contact, but you do want to keep an eye on the bear. A bear that is agitated. Now this is a bear that's letting you know you are too close for comfort. It's gonna maybe be salivating, jaw popping, yawning, groaning, moaning, maybe even foot stomping. Now, this can be a potentially dangerous situation. So you wanna make sure, again, you talk to that bear calmly, let it know you're not a threat. If you have bear spray on you, which I'm gonna recommend that you always carry bear spray, you wanna have this ready in case the bear does charge. If a bear does charge you in a defensive attack, or it's charging with a bluff charge, this is when you wanna use your bear spray to prevent potential injury. Predatory attacks. This is going to be very defensive, very different from a defensive attack. Defensive attacks, there's a lot of noise going on. That bear is letting you know you're too close. In a predatory attack, they're going to cock their ears and they're going to come towards you intently, specifically towards you quietly and very determined. Now, sometimes in very in urban environments, bears are very habituated to people. They're just walking down the trail because it's a path of least resistance. They're comfortable around people. And it's kind of really shocking when you see them. If you go to places like Whistler and they're on a golf course, there's bears helping themselves. It's their home. It's their environment. They're used to people. So all you want to do in those cases, you just want to move off the trail and give it lots of space. But if you're in a more uh, less urban environment uh, where bears are not used to seeing people and you have a bear approaching you, this is more unusual. And you definitely don't want that bear to continue its approach. So you've moved off the trail, it's still coming towards you. You wanna stop, stand your ground. You wanna be loud, assertive, be big. Let that bear know that you're not comfortable with it approaching you. And this is definitely when you wanna have bear spray. If that bear closes the distance and gets within five to 10 meters of you. You wanna make sure you've got that bear spray dis uh, discharged and it's gonna hit that wall. Luckily, predatory tags are very rare. Moving on to bear spray. What is bear spray? So bear spray contains capsaicin, which is basically really hot peppers. It's different from mace, which you see in the United States, and which is not legal in Canada. You're not allowed to use it on people. You could actually be charged in the criminal code. But it is proven to be over 90% effective in deterring a bear attack. And people will sometimes say, well, I'm afraid of getting bear spray on myself. And, and you know, what if I get incapacitated? It's much safer to use bear spray and receive some of the effects in the event of an attack um, than um, not having it at all. So we do recommend you carry bear spray just like you would put on a seatbelt, bring your essentials. You never expect to get into an accident, but the, when, if you do get into an accident, you'd be really happy you had your seatbelt on. And in BC, you have to just assume if you're out there often enough, eventually you're gonna have a bear encounter. And the odds of having a negative encounter are still really low, but you're gonna wanna have that bear spray just in case, just like a first aid kit, in case something goes wrong. Um, you need to be able to access your bear spray in less than two seconds, which means carrying it on a holster, either uh, on your hip or on a chest harness, don't carry it in your pack. You will never get it out in time. Sometimes attacks happen very quickly. Uh, you weren't calling out enough. Maybe there was a stream running by and the wind was blowing the wrong way. Most bears want to avoid people, but if you surprise a bear, you may not have a lot of time. So you want to be able to discharge it 
in less than two seconds. So that means practice. Invest in a can of inert spray so you could practice discharging it or attend a wild safe BC workshop if there's one being held in the community. We do have lots of great resources on our website in terms of videos that show you how to go through the steps. We have a handy acronym called SPRAY and we go through that just to go through the steps of stop, prepare, remove the safety, make a wall, and yield. And it's really good just to practice that so it's muscle memory. And so if something were to happen, you don't have to think, you know how to react. So luckily I went through all of that really quickly. There's a lot to learn and to digest. We have a free online e-learning course available now. It's on our website. We reckon it's about 30 minutes. So I condensed all this in really tight time. It's 30 minutes long. And there's also a link to the Staying Safe in Bear Country video. This 25 minute video was put together by bear biologists and it is still one of the best tools. You actually see live bears in the wild reacting and showing different behaviors. And seeing those different behaviors really helps you prepare for identifying you know, a bear that's agitated, a defense bear, a, a predatory bear, and knowing how to react appropriately and knowing when you should play dead and when you should fight back. And that really depends on that bear's behavior. So please go check out this free course uh, with some really great links. Like I mentioned, we have local workshops. Check out the local Facebook pages. All of our Wild APC programs have their own Facebook page. You can check out to see what workshops they're having. And we also, for those that are leading groups and really are taking seriously learning more about wildlife behavior and awareness and safety, we have a two to three hour certification course that you can take as well that's on our website. Of course, we have a very uh, thorough website with many species. We do talk about black bears, grizzly bears, wolves, cougars, coyotes, and a number of other conflict species. So if you're interested in learning more, please do check out our website. And we have a net, all of our videos are on Vimeo and we do share them on our Wild Wednesdays. We had a, a great Wild Wednesday and we have a new special one coming out on Friday, uh, which shows uh, chemical signaling between bears, which is really fascinating. Um, so those are put out on our Facebook pages, um, but we also have a lot of safety videos on our Vimeo site as well. And please stay in touch through social media, we're active on all platforms. Uh, and our provincial Facebook page is something I would recommend you all follow as we keep updates on incidents that happen and uh, different uh, cycles of bear activity and cougar activity and provide advice as things come up. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa. We definitely have some questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to start off with Scott's question. Do you know where we can bring expired canisters of bear spray? We get asked this at our trailhead so often, um, and I would love to be able to tell people. Unfortunately, um, there is no one right answer for that. You do have to contact whoever handles your solid waste in your community. Uh, and find out, and we're actually, I've tasked actually all of our coordinators where they're working their communities to find out. And we're finding it's not actually an easy answer. Some communities don't have disposal in their communities. Uh, it is treated as hazardous waste. Um, it is best to become informed because there was actually an incident locally where a worker ran over live bear spray with one of his excavators at a landfill and got a face full of it. So he had a really bad day. So it is really important to dispose of it safely. What we do recommend is that go into, when you've expired bear spray, go find a place in the woods that's not well-traveled because once you discharge bear spray, it can actually be an attractant. So bears will actually be intrigued by the smell and may come to investigate. So find a place off of, off a of bean trail, bring gloves, disposable gloves, check the wind and practice and discharge the rest of your bear spray. You've got your empty canister, double bag it, duct tape it, find out where you can dispose of it. You can call the RCMP, sometimes they will take it. Um, and sometimes they'll tell you to dispose it with the regular garbage, but I do recommend contact your local community solid waste manager to find out what, the, what they recommend 
it's different in every area. Excellent. And just to follow up, uh, Simon has just come on with a good tip. In Vancouver, SFU says they can take expired bear spray to use for educational purposes. So there's somewhere, um, at least we know in Vancouver. Um, so I have a question from Kate. And Kate is asking, is an air horn effective to have with you in addition to music on your phone and clapping around rivers in that corners? Air horns, you, you could use an air horn. Um, you want to be judicious with the use of an air horn because if you're doing it in a very popular area we recommend people just call out with their voice because an air horn going off all the time can get a little bit distracting um it's we still recommend the number one inexpensive thing that you're not going to forget is just to call out and yell out with your voice um there, it's mixed in terms of how effective air horns and do do animals actually associate that with people or not? It can also be disturbing even for other wildlife, you know, nesting birds and other animals that are sensitive to those noises. So the number one thing we recommend is using your voice, but it doesn't hurt to have an air horn as an additional backup. That's awesome. Um, and we have a great question from Sarah. Sarah is wondering, um, where do you find inert spray to practice? Um, I know I can. You can buy them at Canadian Tire when you buy your bear spray. They've I've seen now that they come with them. I believe I even saw like two inert cans together on their own. Um, but I'm wondering if Vanessa has any more uh, tips on that. Yeah, I know you can order it online, um, and we have heard that Canadian Tire is starting to stock inert, which is fantastic. Um, but I don't have a full rundown of all the different retailers, unfortunately. I do encourage retailers to carry the inert. Also, one thing I didn't go through was if you can find these as well. I know I've seen these in different stores. This is a travel tote. It's really important not to store your bear spray above 50 degrees centigrade. Do not leave it on the dash of your car. You may not be able to drive your car afterwards if it explodes. So it is pressurized. And if it goes off um, in your vehicle, it's really hard to get that out. The nice thing about these toasts is that they have foam on the inside and it's just a good habit to have it. You get back from your hike, you put this back into here, you put the top on, uh, throw it inside a, another uh, Rubbermaid or inside a pack so it's not jostling around. Keep it as far from the driver as possible. If you have a truck, put it in the dry bed. Uh, but a lot of us are, have SUVs and that's not possible. But you definitely don't want it going off in your vehicle. So it has to be stored above freezing and below 50 degrees. And if you find these, invest in them. They are, I use them all the time and all of our coordinators use them. Awesome. Uh, so I have two people asking. I have Jill and Jane um, asking about bear bells. So Jill is saying, can you address bear bells? Because she's hearing mixed messages. She took some training in Fort Nelson and they said it can seem to be an attractant as they can associate it. Um, and also Jane's just saying uh, she would appreciate your opinion with the use of bear bells. I don't recommend bear bells. You can put them on your dog. There's no harm in that. I would not carry a bell myself. The jingling would drive me bonkers, but we've, we've, we've heard that uh, they rang bells in front of bears and there was no reaction. Like they don't associate it with people. So what we want bears to realize is when they hear a human voice, oh, there's a human in the area, they actually really do want to avoid us most of the time. So using your voice is number one. Also bear bells are very high pitched and they don't penetrate very far into the woods. So I remember someone telling me they were sitting having their lunch. There was a group going by with bells. They went into the trees. She didn't hear them anymore because it just cut down the sound dissipation immediately. So the sound just doesn't penetrate very far. Uh, we've, I've heard them called dinner bells. I, I'm not sure if there's any validity to, to that at all. Um, but in general, again, your voice is free. Use it. Oh, and another tip, if you're with a group, and groups are always safer than small parties, we do recommend that um, don't call out, hey bear. Save that for when you actually encounter a bear. Sing, yodel, have a song, whatever else. And then if you do encounter a bear, that's when you go, bear. Awesome. 
Um, Maria has a great question. What's the shelf life of, of a bear spray? Absolutely, good question. So when you go and purchase bear spray, you wanna check the expiry and you should get at least two to three years. Do not be cheap and go out with expired bear spray. There, it, there's a propellant inside that's what forces the active ingredient out and to make a nice fog of spray, you wanna make a wall of spray. Over time, that propellant starts to dissipate. And so that's what, it, you lose the force and the bear spray just kind of dribbles out and it's not there when you need it. So don't take expired bear spray out. Um, gosh, I could go on and on about bear spray. Take, take the free course and we go through it in a lot more detail. <laughs> Probably missing some key ones in there. Perfect. Um, and can you actually just pop the slide back up that has the course address on it? I have a couple uh, audience members just asking for that link, um, and they just said they didn't have a chance to write it down. Um, so that if would be. You go, if you go to our web, if you go to Wild Safe BC to our website first, yeah, you can do courses and learning, and you'll find all of our courses. But this okay, is great. specific link to the Thinkific site. So we've used Thinkific, and okay. right now we have three. We have the free course and the certification course on there but if you go to our website we have more resources we have like the bear spray video that's there uh links to information about our workshops and the link to the staying safe in bear country video so i would go to our website first if you could that's great Excellent. Um, that is all the audience questions that we have this evening. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for joining us this, uh, tonight, Vanessa. Um, it was a pleasure to have you. I will uh, turn it over to Sandra and let her sign off, and then I will be ending the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Vanessa. That was great. Uh, again, I think we all made some notes tonight. I know um, Natasha and I were back and forth texting saying, well, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. We should figure this out. So really insightful, super information and extra resources that everybody can just go and check on your website later and learn and the and the e-learning is key. I think it's so nice to have that accessibility for everyone. And as we see a continued increase in outdoor recreation in the province of BC in all corners, everywhere we go, that's why we're doing these region specific workshops is to help everybody out there. Um, we know we're an active province. We know we love the outdoors and that everybody loves to get out there. We have easy access. Don't be fooled by that easy access. Let's be prepared and take heed to everyone's advice on our special events here. As I close, I'd just like to remind everybody the three main reasons that we have search and rescue in British Columbia um, through our data-driven insights are injury, lost and disoriented, and exceeding abilities. If you can also think about that as we close tonight and and think about those three, three things the next time you head out and see how you could mitigate those causations and take all the advice that we heard from Wendy, Chris, and Vanessa into your pockets and into your trip plans. Uh, we'll be ahead of the game. Thanks for taking the time to join with us tonight. Um, you will help the 2,500 search and rescue volunteers by getting a little bit more prepared and taking all of this advice. And have a great, great safe summer. And uh, thanks for your time. Good night.